Welcome back to our discussion of the institutions of education and religion. Part two will focus upon the institution of religion and the various theories related to it, as well as some current issues in our society today. Durkheim was the one who described religion as a unified system of beliefs and practices relative to sacred things. And sacred meaning, uh, you know, again, when we think about sacred, there's a lot of emotions that tie up into that and everything. But in, from a sociological standpoint, take the emotions and the feelings away from the word. And essentially, sacred means the opposite of the profane or ordinary kinds of things. So these are extraordinary things that these practices are shaped around. Durkheim believed that there were three elements of religion, and these were that there were beliefs that some things are sacred, practices that centered around those sacred beliefs or those things that were sacred, and a moral community that resulted from this group's beliefs and practices. So beliefs, practices, and the moral community were the elements of religion in Durkheim's definition. Functionalists believe that religion serves some very important uh, roles within our society in order to keep society operating and there are really four primary functions uh, that religion serves first to answer questions about the ultimate meaning of life what is what is what are we here for what what is the larger purpose of our existence what am i what am i uh, what are my commitments and obligations to other people how do i relate to the larger world what happens after death that makes what I do here in my my existence important. These are the kinds of things that uh, religion serves to answer for individuals. Religion also serves to provide for social solidarity. As you, uh, if you belong to an organized religion, at least you may go to services, although less and less it seems as of recently, but you may go to services where you meet with other people who share your beliefs and who um, participate in some common rituals every week, uh, whether it be a religious service, a mass, a revival, um, or um, whatever it might be. Um, and um, together you, you form a community and you feel connected to each other. You may go out and perform good deeds in the community or you may have social events together because of that these your the the youth of the of of this community may have a youth group and go out on activities together so it binds you to other people religion does it binds us with others it offers emotional comfort in times of distress um, it, if there's an earthquake, if there's a, a terrible event in life, when the, you know, for instance, you know, on September 11th, when the towers came, came trashing, uh, crashing down, um, a few days later, when the president actually, in effect, declared war, um, he did so from the pulpit of uh, the National Cathedral, as I recall. We we uh, watched church services where people prayed for the death, uh, for the dead, and for the souls of, of of those individuals, and comfort for those who survived them. Um, this is emotional comfort at times when when there's a great strain on an individual or a group or a community. Um, you find people that don't oftentimes go to church going to church at that time. That is uh, one of the things that it does for us. And fourth, uh, the fourth uh, perspective, or the fourth role, rather, of religion in, in society, according to functionalists, is that it provides guidelines for everyday life and sets limits on behaviors. An interesting thing is that um, the kinds of things that are considered to be sins or sinful behavior uh, in in uh, many religions, uh, most of the mainstream religions, at least, are also the things that. Um, in one way or another are against the law in the civil society around it and so oftentimes mainstream religions reflect the structure and the rules of the societies in which those religions exist and so they really kind of reinforce that that moral order and and the legal order as well now there are dysfunctions uh, of religion that uh, I would say are probably not positive contributions, but sometimes individuals go to war because of religious beliefs, or you know, commit uh, 
terrorist acts because of certain religious beliefs or persecute others uh, in the name of of God for different purposes and things like that. Um, going back to early American history when uh, the Salem witchcraft trials where where women were burned at the stake or murdered because well really it was because they were women but but there were religious uh, uh, reasons cloaked around the the, uh, the behaviors of individuals in those communities in those days. So there can be negative functions of religion in a society as well. Conflict theorists look at religion. Well, Marx really had the, I think, the, the clearest uh, um, statement about this as far as conflict theorists go. And he said that religion serves as the opiate of the masses. And what he means by this is, is that um, religion tends to divert our attention away from the oppression that we face on a day-to-day -day basis. We are taught to accept the trials and tribulations to more or less carry our cross and to uh, see that as uh, the suffering that's associated with these burdens that we have as um, sort of contributions to our eternal salvation. That we're unhappy in this life. We have to put up with so many things in this life we do that for God. Uh, there's a reason for everything, even if we don't know it. God has reasons. God has his or her reasons for expecting this of us. Uh, and if we just go along and we we accept this burden and we live with grace, we'll get into heaven when we die. Our souls will be saved. Now, the conflict theorists would say, what a wonderful way to keep everybody in their place. Not to challenge authority, not to say that I shouldn't have to live with this, but to stand up for oneself uh, and, and to challenge and upend the, the, the social order more or less. And so, so this is why Marx thought that religion was like an opiate. It was something that kind of numbed us to the realities of our life and, and turned our attention away from, from well, numbed the pain in a sense, you know, by giving us a reason for this pain. And, and the thing is, 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 you know, you don't get rewarded for this until you're dead. And so, um, you know, conflict theorists believe that, uh, you know, it's, um, really is not a it's not a useful function it's not a healthy healthy thing for us and so that is why in fact you know that uh, in many of the the communist countries which you know communism kind of grew out of socialism it's sort of the political a sort of a political system that grew out of socialism um, men, some of those uh, many of those communist countries in fact did not permit religion and and this is why um, so it legitimizes social inequalities according to um, conflict theorists that it, the social arrangements that exist in our society represent God's desires. Interactionists will look at religion and will study uh, the meanings, for instance, that people give to their religious beliefs and, and what that religion means to every person. Uh, symbols. Uh, we talked about the symbols of the cross and and the Star of David and um, those kinds of things. Those religious symbols have such a powerful meaning um, that they can provoke a, a great deal of emotion just by um, an individual seeing it and contemplating it and thinking about it. Rituals, um, ceremonies, repetitive practices unite members. So all again, those those kinds of uh, activities that I talked about that that uh, the the moral community gathers around uh, the belief system and, and practices on every Sunday. For some uh, people, uh, the meaning of the religious experience is so powerful, they believe they're born again. I mean, it. it, uh, it um, an example, a great example that interactionists would would love to study in religion, I think, is our our t attempt revivals. And I don't know. I suspect that probably a few of you may have been to them. I had, I never have been, but I've, they've been described to me, and and uh, I've seen some portrayed at least in in movies, whether this done accurately or not. But but you know, basically, um, in in a revival, uh, there is a charismatic leader or somebody who is thought to have some special powers to cure um, illness for instance or something like this and and there are usually a few people that come up and and find themselves cured and whether whether they're shills that are in that are planted in the audience to convince everybody or whether they really are people who believe that their afflictions are cured or whether they really are people whose afflictions are cured these things occur in front of this mass of people and it excites everyone in the tent and the excitement of the person next to you for instance excites you and 
their belief in what they see uh, causes you to believe that you also should believe this and you develop this fervor which is reflected back to the person next to you and may even further um, contribute to their fervor and, and uh, this is the kind of thing that uh, these these ceremonies are highly emotional and are based upon um, um, you know these kinds of beliefs of, of, of supernatural things occurring before their eyes and the, that type of thing this is the kind of thing interactionists would would love to be able to watch and, and observe and and assess can can our can our illnesses and afflictions be cured uh, in in a setting such as that um, traditional Christian teachings uh, traditional teachings of many different faiths in fact um, traditional ministers will tell you that if you believe in something it'll happen in fact one of the tenets of uh, one of the basic tenets behind prayer is if you ask for something in prayer and you believe it it will happen it will be given to you if you have faith in that in 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 your creator and so so um, whether more traditional or or more emotional out, outside the traditional mainstream religion religions um, preach that um, if you believe things can happen that that uh, things can happen and uh, that you know miracles can occur and and uh, psychologists a lot of times will tell you that you know that the power of, of our perception the beliefs we have can change our physical life uh, therapists uh, teach um, people with chronic illnesses uh, ways within their own minds to perform things that help to they believe actually heal speed the healing process and so who's to say that these things aren't real but interactionists would love to assess and watch these things going on Henson looks at um, religion from a from another standpoint and looks at different types of religious groups and he essentially identifies four types of groups and we're going to look at these groups from the ones that are say the furthest away from the mainstream the furthest away from the norms of society so to speak uh, and gradually move towards those that are better organized and bureaucratized so that uh, you'll be more familiar with each as we go along you're familiar with cults, uh, at least with the concept of cults. Um, a, a cult is a is a religious community that organizes around a charismatic leader, and uh, usually that that leader, that charismatic leader, is someone who um, has a great deal of ability to attract persons to him. Um, and in most of the popular religions that we have today, the the more the more traditional religions started with a, a charismatic leader. Um, Jesus Christ was a charismatic leader, Martin Luther, charismatic leader, Muhammad, charismatic leader, and uh, so so really religions kind of get their start sometimes with with this kind of leadership. In a cult, the uh, religious fervor tends to be high. Ultimately, um, the cults tend to fail. And when we talk about leadership uh, in another few weeks, we'll see one of the reasons for this is because when the charismatic leader dies, usually the community around that leader that cult will also die because it is the it is focused very much upon the powers of that particular person um, but if if a cults and and I will also tell you um, and if you're interested in cults you know that we hear very uh, negative things about cults generally in the mainstream media and one of the reasons for this is because they tend to operate outside the typical society they tend to isolate themselves they're perceived as uh, more or less stealing uh, young people and brainwashing them and uh, you know they they uh, can't separate them from their their own families because uh, of the nature of the beliefs that they often practice and and uh, the beliefs about relationships and things and so you'll hear stories of parents you know hiring people to go in and steal children away from cults and and deprogramming them from the things they've been taught and um, you know those those kinds of things tend to be associated when we think about cults we also hear about occasionally you know in the news mass suicides uh, there really haven't been any that I've heard of in recent years but uh, I mean real recently but you know within the last uh, 10 to 20 years you know several different cults that have resulted in, in um, you know dozens of people killing themselves at one time or being killed in defense of their charismatic leader uh, perhaps the most famous cult um, um, uh, 
that uh, was in at least that was uh, in in uh, modern day history it was the Jonestown cult with Jim Jones as the leader and if you're interested really in looking at the story of a cult and the kinds of things that can come out of it um, that's a that's something you should Google and 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 read more about the Jonestown cult and Jim Jones. Um, I still remember the cover of Time magazine when they when they ran across um, all of these dead bloated bodies. Uh, the you know the term about drinking the Kool Aid. You know if you believe you drink the Kool Aid. Well, I think that comes from that experience because um, Jim Jones had laced the Kool Aid and everybody drank it knowing that they were going to kill themselves. So, interesting concept. <clears throat> Cults do survive sometimes, and those that do survive then form what is referred to as a sect, which is a uh, a, more, a loosely organized um, group, a fairly small group. Um, usually, the emphasis is upon personal salvation, um, but it's not really a church. It it, it is uh, yet it's not it's not organized enough to be a church, but uh, um, some eventually turn into churches, and and the Amish is. Um, is mentioned in our text I believe as an example of a sect um, I'm not sure I, I I I think the Amish really connect more as a church um, but uh, I suppose it depends on how you analyze that particular thing now the other thing you'll hear oftentimes about about a sect is um, the um, not so much as one, you know, kind of growing out of a cult, but rather breaking off from a church. Um, that some people within an, um, a church become unhappy and break away um, because they don't feel they feel the church has become too bureaucratized, perhaps, and do, isn't dealing with the spiritual life enough, um, and and uh, kind of break away into their own little section. Uh, that's where the sect word comes from, I believe. And, Churches, um, sect, a sect that does survive and continues to thrive and attracts more attention and more people, as it attracts more people, uh, it, it begins to necessitate to have, uh, having a leadership and to have more organization uh, and to become bureaucratized, and that's where it becomes a church. Churches tend to be very bureaucratized, and a good example of that that I'm familiar with being a Roman Catholic is you know the, the the Roman Catholic Church and the Pope is the leader. The Vatican is uh, you know it's his own country in fact and it's a state that's highly highly bureaucratized and and apparently quite dysfunctional in and of itself. You know and and um, it's it's necessary for members of the of of that religion I think or that faith sometimes to separate themselves from all the bureaucratic stuff that goes on with the church and, and to concentrate on the faith because uh, it is embarrassingly bureaucratized at time. Um, can be national and international, and um, one of the things that you see as as um, as you move from a sect to the church is is that you, the professed relationship with God, that uh, connection to the supreme being, is less intense in a in a more highly organized religious group than it is in a smaller group like a sect. Something that we don't hear much of and and we're not very familiar with is called an ecclesia, and this is a state religion. And I'm I'm wondering, um, you know, I'm I'm thinking about uh, religions where or states where the essentially the, it is where the religion runs the state, so to speak. Uh, it is really a part of the cultural identification. The I know that Poland, for instance, is uh, said to be over ninety percent Roman Catholic, and and um, the church certainly has a high amount of influence upon the government there, and um, it is uh, very very. In fact, you know, it's interesting that the fall of communism. Uh, in many respects began in Poland while we had a Polish Pope who was visiting there frequently and many believe that John Paul II had a lot to do with the fall of communism first in Poland then ultimately in the other countries um, and uh, he was appealing to I think you know the power of religion in that country as opposed to the power of bureaucratized government it's very close to an ecclesia in some respects I believe and so when you here's a chart from the book. When you look at um, the three or the four different types of uh, of um, religious organizations, um, the more that the group has um, the uh, list of emphases on the left, the less it tends to be accepted in a society. 
whereas the more those they have the tendencies on the right, the more accepted by society. So that, you know, from that list, for instance, you know, the 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 uh, evangelism the evangelism is much higher in that that is the need to spread the message, so to speak, is much higher in a cult and a sect than it is in a church or an ecclesia. Um, the notion of personal salvation, um, um, uh, hostility towards other religions and hostility from other religions, feeling rejected by society. Uh, the belief in, in um, the healing uh, intervention of God, uh, God speaking directly to them, um, a literal heaven and a hell, literal interpretation of the scripture. These are things that tend to be less accepted in a larger society, at least in our nation, uh, and, and so tend to be more associated with cults and sects, whereas churches and ecclesias are more associated with wealth and larger organization, um, more worldly success among its members and, and um, um, you know, a, a, a clergy with formalized training also. That's something that you see in, in these other organizations that you don't in cults and sects so much. Um, so you can see really that uh, cult and sext, sect membership generally is made up of individuals from lower socioeconomic groups in churches and ecclesia or with the higher economic socioeconomic groups and in fact among the many churches there are some churches that are associated with higher socioeconomic levels than others and the the mainstream churches the um, that I think the textbook talks about the evangelism the evangelistic churches the fundamentalist churches and religions um, almost lean more towards the sect end of things the blue side because of their insistence upon the literal interpretation of the Bible and and those kinds of things um, um, th there tends to be a higher degree of individuals with lower income in, in the fundamentalist religions than in the uh, other kinds of religions such as uh, I believe it is the Episcopalians and the Jewish religions that are associated with the highest uh, average income among its membership. Some say the hour between 10 and 11 on Sundays is the most segregated hour in the United States, both socioeconomically and racially speaking. Um, but uh, so, so as the book points out, you know, there, um, there's um, certainly some stratification within the religions and, and churches in the United States in particular. Um, the older you get, the more likely it is you are to participate and to go to church regularly. But despite all of this, 94% of all Americans believe that there is a God, even though we don't uh, attend uh, church services very faithfully. Here's a table demonstrating how, uh, how the, the United States adults identify with religion uh, in terms of, um, you know, which... Uh, which churches they belong to, more or less. And um, I, I think um, I have read that one of the, more, the fastest growing churches in the United States, in fact, is the Roman Catholic Church, but I don't think that has so much to do with people flocking back to church as it has to do with uh, the uh, migration of, of larger um, Latino populations into the United States, and let the Latino countries are heavily Roman Catholic. Here also is um, uh, a chart that uh, looks at social class and religious affiliation and um, um, breaks down membership in different churches based upon family income, uh, educational levels, and occupational prestige. And as we close this particular discussion about the institution of religion, the text also spends some time looking at the future of religion. And, and while um, many people believe that organized religion is dying out, you know, at different times there there have been uh, the mood, the intellectual mood of the of the culture that says maybe God is people don't believe in God anymore, or that religion itself is dying, and people don't need a church to connect with their personal savior, those kinds of things, you know, the, but uh, most of the um, 
facts indicate that religion continues to thrive not only around the world but also in the United States um, and that it is likely that religion will continue to be necessary because people are always going to wonder about the purpose of life and and religion is the place that uh, they we tend to go to do we tend to turn for this that there are things that uh, people people believe science can't tell us about things like the existence of God and the purpose of life whether or not an afterlife exists, how to live a decent and moral life, and these are the kinds of things that we we draw from religious belief beliefs. So, that will end this week's lecture altogether. And uh, if you have any questions uh, about any of this material, please do let me know. Otherwise, I'll talk again with you next week.